Hello everyone and welcome to the podcast. Life is a story we tell ourselves. I'm your host, Don Murphy, and I am really excited and happy to be hosting this episode. Most of you know I spent my career as a ranger, director of California State Parks, and deputy director of the National Park Service. We will be talking about conserving and protecting our natural resources, not just locally, but worldwide. On this episode, we're joined by Brian O'Donnell. Brian is the executive director of the Campaign for Nature. For more than two decades, Brian has been a leading land and wildlife conservationist. The Campaign for Nature is an effort supported by the Weiss Foundation to increase global targets and financing for protected areas under the Convention on Biological Diversity. He has helped build international support for a global target of protecting at least 30% of the Earth's land and seas by 2030. Brian helped organize a high ambition coalition of more than 95 countries to support the campaign's goals. Today, we will be talking about this ambitious worldwide effort to protect 30% of the Earth's biodiversity by the year 2030. The Campaign for Nature is at the forefront of advocating for this ambitious effort. Brian, welcome to Life is a Story We Tell Ourselves. Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. (laughs) That's great. So, Brian, what started you on your life's journey to protect our Earth's biological diversity? Was there some singular event that influenced you? You know, I was always thinking back on that. I've, I feel like I've always had a strong passion for for nature, for spending time outside, for wildlife. And and when I think about it, I can't think of one singular event. It's it feels like something that uh, I don't know, it seems odd to say you're born with it, but uh, but I've I've always just felt this real connection uh, to the outdoors and to nature. Certainly had great experiences <clears throat> camping with my family growing up uh, in the Northeast. We also lived overseas in Egypt for for quite a while, and uh, and spending time in the desert, which is just a magical place, um, all influenced me and in wanting wanted me to engage in in making sure that that uh, those areas endured and 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 uh, that future generations would have that same benefit that I had. But I, but I can't pinpoint that one event. It's it's more of something that just just feels in my bones. So you might have that uh, strong connection. I'm reminded by. Uh of a uh, interview I did with uh, the famed biologist E.O. Wilson. Uh, mm. His book, Biophilia, first came out. We were on the old Osgood files. I don't know if you remember that program. I but, do remember uh, that, yes. Mm-hmm. But in that, that program, we are on that program actually joined by uh, the boxer George Foreman. Uh, and we were talking about that natural connection, that kind of thing that all human beings are born with, this natural proclivity towards uh, nature. And the point of having George Foreman on the program was that, you know, he was in the Job Corps. He was also in the juvenile justice system as a youth. Mm -hmm. And but when he joined the Job Corps, he went to Grants Pass, uh, Oregon. And for the first time, and this is almost a quote, he says, I had never seen all the beautiful trees and the streams and it changed my life. It it gave me a connection I'd never had before. And, uh, and on the program, E.O. Wilson was making the point about how uh, human beings, of course, have this natural connection and proclivity towards nature and how that uh, connection and that proclivity towards nature is, is actually healing and it benefits our physical and psychological well-being. So I can well understand how you probably had that uh, inborn from, from a child and it, and it was cultivated by those experiences you had. Well, you know, I've I've always been a fan of George Foreman as a boxer, and now you've made me more of a fan of him as a as a naturalist as well. So that's that's a great story. <laughs> yeah, he's a great guy. Um, so tell us about the campaign for nature and its effort to uh, advance the thirty by thirty project. Sure. So campaign for nature is relatively new. Um, we came about uh, just less than five years ago. And really the the birth of the of the effort was to respond to the the biodiversity crisis that we're facing on the planet, this this incredible loss of of natural systems and, and a path that we're on where we are seeing increasing species placed on a threatened and endangered lists. We're seeing uh, increased deforestation. 
dramatic overfishing of the of the world's oceans and and the the campaigns that that many of us who are part of the campaign for nature had been involved with of getting new protected and conserved areas locally we're making progress, but not at the pace and scale that that was truly needed to avert the biodiversity crisis, to take on these biggest challenges and to set a global vision where we could have a solution that's commensurate with the problem. Um, when we were thinking about this it was the same time that E.O. Wilson's book came out proposing protecting half of the of the planet uh, for for nature. So these ideas were sort of converging in a number of pockets um, and Campaign for Nature decided that this was a great time to help build global support for a global goal to protect at least 30 percent of the world's lands and oceans by 2030, uh, an effort that truly address the largest causes of biodiversity loss, which is which is the loss of habitat on land and and really over exploitation in the seas, taking too much, too much, too many fish out of the sea. Um, so so if we could get to those core issues uh, addressing habitat, we thought a global goal could help galvanize support to help address this this crisis head on. So how did this convention convene? Who convened this original convention on biological diversity with all these countries? How did it come about? You know, this this started back in, in 1992, or actually in the lead up to, to the Rio Earth Conference, which took place in, in 1992, the Rio Earth Summit, uh, which was the, the largest and the most important global gathering uh, to discuss uh, cooperation among the, the nations of the world on how to address the biggest issues facing the environment. And, and at the time you had the convention on climate change was was um, was developed there as well as the convention on biological diversity and a separate convention to combat desertification. So those are what's often referred to as the three, three Rio conventions. It was a real turning point for global momentum and cooperation for the planet. Um, that said, it, the follow through has not been nearly as strong. We, we see this in climate change. We see this in biodiversity. But that was the um, that was the idea that there needed to be a, a global treaty that dis, that defined how we can work together as one global community for for nature, recognizing that our natural systems are interconnected. The, the birds we see often migrate uh, from far distances. The oceans and the, the fish and, and, and whales we see migrate. Uh, our climates are, are interrelated. So we, we have to address this on a global scale. Uh, local action is important, but, but it, local action alone isn't enough. No, I, I understand. I, I remember that quite well because that following year after 92, I think it was in 93 or 94 in San Diego, there was a World's Ocean Conference uh, for the first mm -hmm. time. I, I uh, spoke at that conference and I know that conference led to a, a focus on the ocean that had never really existed before. Um, so it's made a lot of difference. Um, could you tell us a little bit about um, the uh, campaign for nature and uh, your efforts to advance this 30 by 30 project. What exactly uh, are you doing kind of on a day-to-day -day regular basis? Sure. Um, so when you have a, a big global goal like that, um, obviously there's, there's quite a, quite a large amount of work to get that uh, agreed upon in a global convention. And, and it, and it really starts with, getting the science right, <clears throat> making sure that um, we are taking what scientists have told us is needed. And, and they have told us that we need to protect and conserve at least 30% of the world's um, lands and oceans and getting that science in front of policymakers. So we do quite uh, a number of meetings with environment ministers, at times with heads of state, certainly with the media to share both the causes of biodiversity loss, but the potential solution. So that's uh work that in, engages with travel around the world. We have teams of, of scientists, of former environment ministers, of other policy advocates who work in different regions to try to share this science with, with the public. Uh, we work closely with indigenous communities who are really the frontline defenders of, of nature and securing their territories is a clear pathway for achieving the 30 by 30 goal. So um, doing a lot of listening with indigenous communities and learning from, from their approaches, which have been more successful than many other uh, endeavors to protect nature. We work at a number of the global 
policy decision-making forum. So that could be uh, the UN General Assembly. Uh, the UN Environmental Program has a, a meeting every few years of environment ministers. So those are opportunities to meet with environment ministers to share this policy idea and to build support. And then more recently, we've worked with a number of countries, including Costa Rica, the United Kingdom, and France, to help get a thing called the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People. And this is a coalition of countries that have all signed up to support 30 by 30. So we we work to support that effort. We encourage other countries to join that coalition. And we share information about the 30 by 30 plan, why it's important for species, why it's important for people, and, and how it can be enacted. Right. Let's take a little bit of a digression here for a minute, because sure. I live uh, amongst uh, numerous indigenous uh, communities uh, here in Ecuador, where I live. And it certainly isn't consistent throughout all of the communities, a ethic for protecting the land. One of the things that I noticed when I came here was the tremendous pollution of rivers, uh, riparian areas uh, in particular, from cattle, sheep, pig grazing. Uh, the rivers in indigenous communities are extremely uh, polluted here in the Andes. And, it, and the government has signs up uh, all over the highways saying to protect nature and, and that water is life, uh, trying to educate uh, indigenous communities about protecting uh, the natural environment. So what have you found worldwide? Because certainly here in, in the communities I live in, uh, there's not a clear ethic that uh, you should protect uh, nature. Well, we've seen in studies that have been done over the last really 15 years, um, a look at where biodiversity loss is happening. And it has shown that in territories where indigenous peoples have tenure rights and, and real real land ownership or, or control, management control over their territories, biodiversity uh, loss is occurring at a much slower rate than even in state-run protected areas. So they have done a, a, a better job, um, indigenous communities, than, than, than governments in, in terms of protecting nature. In, in, in Primarily, this was looked at in the uh, tropical areas of Latin America, as well as, as um, some areas of Africa and, and Asia, where, where much of the world's biodiversity is concentrated. So um, <clears throat> while it's not universal, I do believe that indigenous people's management approaches uh, a more of a connection with nature and a, a, a sense that we are part of nature as opposed to separate from it. Um, and that the fact that nature and maintaining it is not only central to um, not only central for wildlife, but central for for cultural well-being, for language and for societal goals in indigenous communities is something that um, I think world leaders can learn from and, and, and look at these approaches. There's also been quite a bit of an emerging field of taking indigenous traditional knowledge about plants, animals, species and, and management and, and trying to merge that with Western science to come up with some really uh, innovative ways to manage land and to safeguard species. So it's a, it's an emerging field, and um, it's it's different than the way things have been done for for the last twenty or thirty years, or maybe even fifty years, where conservation of nature was really in um, on the global political scale was done just through through governments as opposed to through centering indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should uh, be clear when we're talking about indigenous people. For example, here in Ecuador, there are uh, indigenous tribal communities in the Amazon, which are very consistent with what you're talking about, with a very focused um, idea about how to preserve nature, how to be one with nature, how to work with nature. And you don't see the same kind of biological uh, diversity loss that, that we're talking about here. But on the other hand, there are indigenous communities that are, I would, I don't know if I'm coining a phase or phrase or not, but are more modern uh, indigenous communities that are kind of on the fringe or have transitioned to being more modern and they're farming, uh, lots of agriculture, lots of slash and burn uh, going on, which of course historically has gone on for thousands of years, but, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, um, there seems to be a gradation or a, or a difference in in the levels of indigenous community protections of, of biological diversity. Has your science found that that's the case? 
Well, I think I think it's yeah. It's always dangerous to to overgeneralize, um, and so and there's obviously a huge diversity of of indigenous peoples and communities and, and approaches. Um, I think what you do find is that more traditional practices tend to be. Um, better for biodiversity, and and as we see a, a change of any any group of of peoples to embrace much more of a consumer um, and and capitalist system, uh, where where we're talking about how much we can produce and how much we can consume, then we see uh, we quickly start to um, <clears throat> expand the boundaries of of what the the planet can sustain. So um, I think that's true of all peoples that uh, those who practice kind of living lighter on the land, whether that's in our diets, in our um, in our consumption patterns, in our approaches to nature, um, there is a big, a big variation. Um, you know, here in the United States where I live, we are one of the largest consumer nations on the planet. Our, our lifestyles are such that if, if everyone on the world had a similar approach to consumption, we would need several planets worth of resources to to maintain that, and so I think that's a, that's a key lesson for all of us is that uh, we all have a responsibility to kind of think about our our impacts on the planet, how where our food comes from, where the materials we use come from, and what the impacts will be for for everything else that we share this planet with the, the wildlife, the, the plants, and the rest of our our fellow human beings. Yeah, indeed. So you mentioned the science. So what is this exactly the science that supports? protecting specifically 30% of the Earth's biodiversity by 2030. Was there a group of scientists that got together and published papers and then sat down and said, okay, the result of all of our efforts here is that we should be protecting 30% of the Earth's biodiversity by, by 2030. How did the science work with that particular goal? Sure. Um, there was a group, similar to what you said, a number of scientists got together and published a, a really important piece in a journal called Science Advances uh, a few years ago called A Global Deal for Nature, in which they they said that this was the minimum, uh, the 30%, um, as long as, along with additional areas set aside for climate um, resilience. Uh, that's not the only paper. We've seen uh, a range of figures that scientists have said that uh, of the amount of land that must be protected and conserved in order to avert the worst aspects of biodiversity loss and to minimize the amount of species we'll lose. You know, 30% isn't a magic number in its own. It's a, it's a sort of a minimum threshold that we've seen where the science goes. There are figures that um, some that go as high as 75% and, and, and some a little lower. But in general, the convergence of the science is that 30% is really the minimum that we need. And, and we've seen this um, from climate scientists who in the recent IPCC, the, the climate, the, the world's leading climate body of scientists has said that we need to to um, protect and conserve it, at least this range to help meet the Paris climate agreement. Uh, we've seen this in a number of other smaller and large publications. Our website, campaignfornature.org, has has a links to all of these different studies. So uh, interested listeners to the podcast can go and, and dig into the details of the science. There's quite a convergence uh, of, of um, scientific review of area-based conservation and, and, and uh, this 30% figure shows up as, as really the minimum that we need to conserve. Yeah, I want to mention that again, that uh, campaignfornature.org, where our listeners can go and find out more details about uh, this uh, very ambitious uh, effort. You know, I understand there's been billions of dollars committed to this effort. Uh, where does that money come from and how is it spent? And, and is the spending monitored at all to see whether or not it's producing the result that results that you want to see by 2030? Sure, we have seen some really fantastic commitments of resources to help to help meet this goal. The most recent one happened just about a year ago during the UN General Assembly. A group of nine different uh, philanthropic organizations and entities came together to announce a thing called the Protecting Our Planet Challenge, and they pledged five billion dollars towards uh, implementing Thirty by Thirty. This was done. These are individual organizations. This include things like the Weiss Foundation, the Bezos Earth Fund, uh, the Rob and Melanie Walton Foundation, the Bloomberg Philanthropies, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, to name a few of these entities. So during about a year ago, 
uh, during the UN General Assembly, nine different different philanthropists and foundations came together to to create what was called the Protecting Our Planet Challenge, which is five billion dollars committed to th- the thirty by thirty effort. Um, so they had each pledged this money with the idea that this money would go to indigenous peoples conservation organizations, uh, other local actors who are working to help get the 30 by 30 goal met. Additionally, you have public funders, governments. Uh, The German government puts in quite a bit of money for biodiversity, USAID, the French Development Agency. uh, The UK is certainly involved in putting in money, as is Canada, to help support implementation of this goal, both domestically and then, of course, internationally. You asked about, you know, how is this this money tracked and how is it monitored? And that's that's a true challenge in this because these are all independent entities. So you have the government of Germany has its approach for how it monitors and how it um, articulates and shares the information about where the money went and what impact it's having. Separately, the Moore Foundation is a private private uh, foundation, and it has its own categories of how it does. So it can be quite an undertaking to kind of trace all of this money, see where it was spent, see where the impacts are happening, and then look at the metrics, because often a public donor and a public and a private donor may have very different metrics for what they're considering uh, success of that funding. So it's a, it's a difficult enterprise. That said, there is such a huge finance gap for protecting biodiversity, that all of this money is welcome and much more is needed. There there will be more monitoring and reviews needed as more money comes into this space, but but it's still a, a major shortfall in terms of the amount of money that's needed to implement 30 by 30. Yeah, well, would I ask how the money's being spent and, and where does it go and whether or not it's it's being monitored? There are, I'm sure, literally thousands of projects going on worldwide, uh, all being supported in some various way. So I was just wondering if there's a compendium or some place you would go to find out where this money is being spent and what result it is producing and how it's being uh, evaluated. Is there is there such a thing or uh, is, is it, as you say, just all very individual and someone like me, a podcaster, would have to go and gather all this information, pile it on a table and uh, put it together. Unfortunately, it's closer to the latter than the former. Um, There are, but I think people are recognizing that challenge. And so there has been an effort to try to collate this information and make it more easily accessible. This often happens around the climate convention, the conference of parties and the biodiversity conference of parties. There is a a stock taking of what is the status of existing funding and where is it going? Campaign for Nature has also tried to do that as well. We've we've done, I think, more than most entities, an effort to at least see how much money is going and where generally it is um, it is headed. Now, in terms of the the outcomes, I think the best way to, to determine if it's making an impact on, on the, at least the 30 by 30 program, the World Conservation Monitoring Center, which is an outfit in uh, Cambridge in the UK, keeps what they call a protected planet report. And they share publicly the state of conservation in each country. They review what percentage of the land is protected or conserved, as well as the oceans. And then they also do an analysis of whether the areas are well managed and if they are equitably managed. So they're they're taking in the needs of local communities and, and fairly managing these places. So they're a good source to look on a, on a effort to see how this how this is being this money is is actually achieving that 30 by 30 outcome in a spatial area but it is still a long way to go and i would say one of the challenges of having a a huge diversity of funding sources is that they each are going to have their own their own structures and 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 uh that's a benefit to have all these different people putting money into the pot but it is a challenge when it comes to reporting and and knowing knowing how each of these things are are being measured you mentioned climate change uh earlier is there coordination or cooperation between climate the climate change treaty uh, and the 30 by 30 project um, they have to be connected in some way I mean, they, they are connected from a I mean the in the most simple way scientists have shown that 
protecting nature, uh, especially areas that are that have store quite a bit of carbon. And this these are, tend to be tropical forest, kelp beds in the ocean, mangroves, uh, as well as peat lens are all incredibly important to conserve those areas. If we have any chance of meeting the Paris Climate Agreement, we need to conserve those areas. So the climate scientists recognize this. You know, I think there was a real mistake that was made. We talked about back to the start of this effort and the Rio conventions back in 1992. I think if we could go back in time, we wouldn't have created a separate biodiversity convention and a climate one because it really forced policymakers into silos. And the climate convention has primarily focused on the energy side of the equation and not given nearly enough focus on nature, even though we've heard that that nature could play a massive role in helping us meet the climate goals. And in fact, we have to conserve some of those areas I mentioned if we have any chance of meeting the the Paris Agreement. Um, So there's increasing attempts to to do synergy between these two conventions, but but often you have different negotiators go to each convention. Their their schedules are in different times and in different cities. So it it creates this sort of um, siloed effect that I think is unhealthy for the planet. While the rhetoric is good about the need to bring these things together, uh, we don't yet see nearly enough of that on a global scale. So we're we're attempting to do that on finance and on policy. Uh, I do go to the climate conventions as well as the biodiversity one, as does our team, to try to try to make the case for a synergy. And there's a number of countries that are really doing these two in concert. The UK, Colombia, Costa Rica are all seeing these things as as intertwined. Gabon in in Africa as well is is doing this. So there's some leadership there, but on a global level, unfortunately, there's still too much division between the two conventions. Yeah, I understand. Is there anybody working on bringing them together or tying them more closely? Um, there are a number of of um, nonprofit organizations that have been trying to do this. Environmental organizations have been doing it. Um, I would say the the leaders of the Green Climate Fund, which is the largest uh, finance mechanism for climate change, and then the Global Environment Facility, which is the finance mechanism for biodiversity, their two CEOs have really tried to work closely together and and bring the policy together and make sure the finance al- align. So I. I I tip my hat to them because I think they are trying to bring the things together and they're, they've been really admirable. Um, one the leader of the global environment facility person by the name of Carlos Manuel Rodriguez was the former environment minister of Costa Rica. And, and he really does see both sides of the coin between climate change and biodiversity and, and has been a global leader in both of those arenas. Yeah, he's a good guy. Um, I understand that each country that has committed to 30 by 30 is required to have a biodiversity action plan. Uh, is that correct? They they will be required if this is agreed upon at the at the conference of parties, which comes up in, in Montreal. So if uh, we have a major event in Montreal in December where the nations of the world will gather to negotiate this, what they're calling a post-2020 global biodiversity framework. This is the agreement in which the 30 by 30 goal would be included. If that is agreed to, each country then agrees to create what's called a national biodiversity strategy and action plan. So it's a, it's a mouthful, but it's basically a strategic plan for how they will safeguard biodiversity within their country's borders, as well as how they'll finance that. So in the past, countries have developed these plans, but they've taken quite a long time to come together and they haven't put enough political heft behind them. So a plan without political buy-in and without money becomes just a just a report that's filed and gathers dust on a shelf somewhere. So yes, these countries will be required to develop these plans, but the most important part is will there be buy-in across all levels of the government? Will these plans be developed in a way that is participatory and engages communities and people feel ownership and enthusiasm for them? And most importantly, will there be money to help enact these plans? Because without that, we won't see the progress we need. Yeah, I understand. So I, I know there are arguments against over-centralization, um, and there's certainly an argue to, argument to be made that uh, the best way to approach uh, something this large and this global uh, is locally because mm-hmm. every area is different uh, mm-hmm. and requires a, a different approach. But there seems to me that there may need to be uh, some sort of centralized 
uh, entity that's that's coordinating all of this. In other words, overseeing and making sure that commitments are are made and that, that, that these commitments are are honored and that the right kind of monitoring uh, is done so that the, at the end of the day, uh, if there are critics or people looking from the outside in seeing all of this money going to, to this kind of effort um, and legitimately wanting to know whether it's producing uh, results, particularly when you know, the world is in the shape that it is today. Mm -hmm. I mean, from pandemics to continuing wars to political strife to civil wars in, in countries, uh, there are all sorts of levels of priorities. So I think it's legitimate for, for governments in particular, you know, to ask, is, is this being well coordinating? Is the money sure. being well spent? And are we going to see real results at the end of the the day. So back to the beginning, do we need something, a centralized uh, body um, overseeing all of this? You know, I think, first of all, um, the premise of your question, I, I agree with. And I think it is important that that something as big as this and as important and where you're seeing billions of dollars pledged to it, that that it be done effectively, that it be done equitably and that it be monitored and reported on and, and, and that this effort is transparent. There's there's two or three entities that are that are currently in the works that are either close to being um, fully launched or contemplated. One is an effort that um, it is, is working to help countries develop their strategic plans on, on biodiversity. And that effort would help also coordinate the, the um, implementation of them. And the second is this high ambition coalition that I mentioned earlier. There is a discussion about making this a permanent entity that could help countries implement 30 by 30, share information about the effectiveness and the finance, and making sure there is a place for, for individuals to go to find out what's working well, what's not working, where's the money going, where can countries go for resources, as well as, you know, there are concerns that any effort on this a 30 by 30 effort, we need to make sure it's done in a way that doesn't have forced displacement of people. Um, mm -hmm. In the past, many protected areas had had forcibly moved people out. And we need to make sure that 30 by 30 doesn't do that. And having a mechanism like a high ambition coalition that can exist after the deal to make sure that it's being done fairly and equitably is important. So uh, I agree with you that this needs to happen. I think in general, I also liked in your question, I thought you phrased this very well, that we need both a global vision and something on the scale of 30 by 30 to meet the, the massive challenge in biodiversity loss. But that doesn't mean that 30 by 30 needs to be implemented in exactly the same way in each country. We mm -hmm. We have very different circumstances and approaches to conservation and protected areas and indigenous territories. And there should be a a, a global vision, but a local implementation that that takes in the local knowledge and approaches that that we can benefit from, so that this can be uh, the diversity of the world's peoples and approaches we can benefit from and see this this project kind of build up from the bottom while while meeting that uh, global vision. Absolutely. Well, we're going to take a break here in in just a, a minute, and we're going to come back and ask. Brian, a couple of personal questions about his life and the future of protection and restoration of our most important biological and, and natural resources. Again, Brian is the executive director with Campaign for Nature. You can go to campaignfornature.org. We'll also have information up on our website at lifeisastorypodcast.com that you can go to, and we'll have a whole page dedicated to uh, this particular podcast and the uh, environment and 30 by 30. So we'll be back in just a minute. Um, if you'll hold on, uh, we'll continue this discussion. So, Brian, this has really been an interesting discussion, and I can't tell you how excited I've been to have you on the program with us. Um, so my final question that I'd like to explore with you is kind of a personal one, 
And mm -hmm. it's how have you been affected by your experiences in the world's natural and wild places? Um, is there an experience that you could point to that you would characterize as transcendent or something that, that's been life changing for you? Uh, probably several of them, I would say, Don. I, I think that, um, well, first of all, thanks for including me in this podcast and for covering the issue. It's been really great to to have to cover these issues and discuss them. Um, I'd say one experience I had was in Alaska, uh, backpacking with my wife, and, and uh, we had one other couple with us, so four of us, and we had been in Denali National Park, uh, and we're, I don't know if you've ever been to Denali, but uh oh, yes. it's nice and it does, excellent but it doesn't have trails and so you and and they try to limit the amount of people in various sections of the of the park so you you have to uh, plan your trip of where you're going to be in different zones at different times and i was uh we were on this backpack trip and we just weren't making nearly enough progress up in the in the high tundra in terms of the distance we needed to travel to be back uh, in the day we wanted to come out a few days later so we needed to go down to the riverbed to to make some progress um these are these braided gravel riverbeds but these also tend to be the places where uh where wildlife and and grizzly bears tend to also use as their their kind of super highways uh, and after an exhausting trip down, bushwhacking through some of the some of the brush to get down there, we had just um, come down through a <clears throat> over a little edge, and immediately encountered a, a grizzly bear, um, and and that was a, a bear kind of raised on its hind legs, sniffing us. Um, and at that point, you realize the little bear spray container that you have is uh, is, is nowhere near <laughs> sufficient to defend yourself. Um, and fortunately, that bear didn't charge us. But but I have to say, my heart was beating a lot faster than it than it ever had been. And it was the first time in in the wild where I truly felt uh, that I was the not the top predator out there. Uh, and it that is just an experience that you have to have to 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 feel connected in nature in a different way. I mean, you, there's I've I've been hunting, I've fished, I've hiked, and paddled and been all throughout nature and and had very great experience in in wild places but that was the first time it felt different on just a, a real survival level that i hadn't felt before and not survival in in terms of you know worrying about hypothermia but survival in terms of being uh potentially killed by a, by another creature and that was um uh, that was both on one hurt it's incredibly frightening but after it's over it exhilarating and uh, made you kind of feel part of nature in a way that at least I hadn't before. No, I, I understand. So important. I mean, there are all sorts of experiences that people can have from standing on the rim of the Grand Canyon or uh, paddling through a class five rapid or uh, just watching a, a beautiful sunset sitting on the beach. They all connect us uh, mm -hmm. to nature and remind us of, of where we, we came from or whether it's being at Arches National Park uh, at midnight and looking up at the stars and and knowing that um, the same thing that the stars are made of, you're made of. All of these important uh, connections uh, instill in us, I hopefully, a sense of not only awe and wonder, but also a sense of responsibility. One thing I always like to say um, in speeches I give is that, you know, being sentient doesn't make us special. It, it makes us accountable. And mm, great, as, great line. Yes. And as sentient beings, I think when we're out in nature, we should be reminded that we're, we are accountable for uh, our stewardship and protection of our natural and cultural resources. And that's why I was so excited about having you on the program today. And I hope to follow up with some programs in the future where perhaps we can talk to some of the funders um, sure so to some of the people that are on the ground working on a day-to-day -day basis actually making this happen we'll have some representatives from the indigenous communities that have been uh, committed to protecting our biodiversity uh, through their cultural practices for, for perhaps generations and uh, we're going to be talking to some of those people too Brian, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Thank you for the work that, that you and your team do. I wish you a lot of success, and I'm going to try to make it to that meeting in Montreal so I can uh, grab some people and put them on this podcast. 
Well, that's perfect. Well, thanks for for the opportunity and for covering thirty by thirty and 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 nature and biodiversity in general. It's also great to speak with someone uh, who is so uh, has such a long career and and success in conservation. You've you've uh, you've been a leader in this space for so long, and so um, it's great to talk to you. Uh, thanks, Brian. Um, and we'll talk to you again soon. Sounds great. Hope to see you in Montreal. All right. Well, that was every bit as exciting and informative as I hoped it would be. I hope you enjoyed hearing about 30 by 30, the ambitious effort to protect 30% of the Earth's biodiversity by the year 2030. To learn more, please subscribe to the podcast wherever you access your podcasts or go to our website at lifeisastorypodcast.com where we will have a page dedicated to the 30 by 30 project or log on to campaignfornature.org. Stay safe, share happiness, and remember, never stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. 